Hello, everyone. Today is the uh, third lecture in our series on hermeneutics. And um, once again, what we're doing right now is just uh, showing the validity and the value of those hermeneutical rules that we've already given you a general overview of um, through the verses of scripture that we're going to present to you. There's many more, okay? So we just want to make sure that every one of our rules, as I've said before, are something that we clearly see that the word of God would direct us to uh, approach his word with these types of rules. And um, so um, let me just start off and uh, with uh, rule number three here and see if I can't move through this a little bit faster um, in the biblical proofs that our rules are valid. So um, this rule number three really is uh, directed at transmission of the word of God. And it does dovetail into rule number two, approaching God's word with awe and reverence, which unfortunately we don't have a lot of folks doing that. Uh, in modern times, we have a lot of arguments going on, even though we've had great scholars throughout the centuries that were what we would call textual criticism scholars, even though the majority of the texts, even I think there's approximately seven texts from the first and second century, uh, which basically represents 43% approximately, I believe Dr. Wallace said, um, I'm not done this research myself, but it represents 43% of the New Testament and, you know, uh, we have more than, uh, well, just under 6,000 manuscripts today uh, that are mostly complete um, and far more fragments. I mean, thousands of fragments, probably the most fragments would probably be in Latin, but, you know, from this, uh, then you have the Greek Orthodox tradition, the Syriac tradition, the Coptic tradition, on and on. Um, I, you know, I think P53, P50, P53 and P45, I think are, are, you know, two of the very oldest that I'm referring to. And then people get fixated on the Tischkendorf texts, and which is really what, what I believe USB4 is all centered around. And I don't want to get into extant manuscripts, but I do want to just talk a little bit about transmission because there's been great scholars. I mean, you take uh, Professor Albright, you know, the, the great archaeologist and biblical uh, scholar, you know, in his statements of proof of how that archaeology has really, you know, removed the question. Uh, re it's removed the question of the historical uh, reality a, a, a of the Bible and um, and on and on to many good scholars today. So transmission is something that, uh, you know, none of us should be in doubt of. We've got people who don't even believe in the Bible, who are right, don't even believe in God, who don't even believe, you know, in the wonderful blessed grace that has been given to us through Christ Jesus. And yet they're you know, writing all these various different things and comments on the word of God. And, you know, and, and it brings a lot of confusion here. And everybody's saying, oh, there's many different interpretations to the scripture. No, there's not. There's not many interpretations to the scripture. And that's what uh, point three is going to really, once again, highlight. We're going to highlight that more as we go on. But, you know, it's, it's just take a simple example. You know, if you sit down to, to play Bible trivia, how many answers do you have to the question? You don't have, it could be A, it could be B, it could be C, it could be D, it could be E, it could be F, and so on. You're, it's going to be one answer. I mean, <laughs> it's not going to be an abstract game. Otherwise, there's no rules and everybody's answers are going to be correct if there are many interpretations. And if there are many interpretations to the scripture, then what man are you choosing to follow? So that's just simply not the case. You know, um, we know what Jesus' mother's name was. We know what Jesus' name was. We know what his, his um, uh, earthly representation of a father was, what his name was, Joseph. 
uh, you know, we can go on and on like this. We know um, the name of the giant that David killed, on and on. So, and somebody says, oh, you're oversimplifying. This doesn't really work that way. It's more abstract when you're dealing with poetry and figurative speech and allegorical speech and then prophecy and symbolic speech. No, it's not. And, um, you know, I challenge people on that all the time. God gave to us his word in simple human language. And then those things which Christ Jesus said, uh, when he categorically talked about a group of people that would be able to understand God's word, his word, um, he made it that category of those who were the simplest, those who would just take it at face value, the children. So he said, be converted, become like a little child. And, and he said very clearly, Lord, I thank you that you've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, and you've revealed them unto babes. So, you know, these, these folks aren't going to be satisfied. It doesn't matter, for example, that God said about a hundred times that, <laughs> or it's repeated about a hundred times, that the Lord said, you know, uh, to Moses. It doesn't matter that the Lord says that over And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, <laughs> And then you have verse of scripture like Joshua 22 that says concerning these things which the Lord spoke unto you by the hand of Moses. I mean, it doesn't matter how many times the scripture lays it out there and gives us a revelation that God spoke to Moses and Moses wrote it down that you're going to still have a bunch of people out there saying, no, it wasn't written till the days of Ezra or Josiah. And, and it's just inescapable. So you have to let those folks be those folks. And, um, you know, understand that there is a whole lot of smoke screen going went down when, or going up. <laughs> it's really going down. It's not ascending. It's not like the, the offering. But it's, 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 going, it's going on. Let's just put it that way for right now. <laughs> where somehow you've got to go trust in a man to get your interpretation of the scripture. Praise God for apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The Lord gave them to us um, so that we would receive right out of another depth or, 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 or instructional right out of the depths of the, of the Holy Ghost and the giftings of the Spirit. And always they have to be evaluated on the basis of what the word of God plainly says. As I said last time, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Okay, so we can go through every period of time, beginning with the Torah, and we can see where the Lord puts his seal upon it and makes it very, very clear that this is what the Lord said by Joshua, for example, Joshua, now in the, in the conquest, now in Palestine, in Israel, uh, the, in ancient Canaan, um, saying, once again, putting a stamp of approval, this is what God said. Every then, every period of time, this is what God said and delivered either by Moses or by a, a prophet along the way. So, Let's just, you know, try to, let me see if I can try to be brief. It's really very difficult for me to be brief, but let's just look at rule number three. We must recognize that all scripture was spoken by God through holy men who faithfully delivered his word to us. Somebody said, well, that's just faith. No, it's not. It's not just faith. It's really provable. And somebody said, well, how is it provable? It's provable by the scriptures itself. Just take the total volume of the word of God as it was transmitted. I mean, take, you take, for example, um, you know, the, the, uh, the um, uh, Leningrad text and uh, the Aleppo text of the uh, Hebrew Bible. And you say, well, we've only got two. We don't have an autograph, but these are two, you know, extant manuscripts that contain the whole of the Old Testament, many, many different fragments but the two that contain the whole of the Old Testament. Then all of a sudden, somebody has a discovery 
And there are many discoveries like this. And it's the Qumran Caves. And now we have every book in the Bible except for, um, I think it's, I think it's Esther. Forgive me if I'm wrong on that. It's Esther or Ezra. Got my E's messed up this morning. Um, and, and there it is validated. And that's removed by how many centuries? I mean, that's like second century BC, okay? And uh, then it's just validating the, uh, what has been transmitted um, unto us to this day. And that is, an, of course, and you, I, I understand when you bring, and this is for some of you guys that are in more, a little more advanced. I understand when you bring the, the family of the Septuagint, the Greek manuscripts of the Old Testament, into play, that, yeah, there's going to be some variation and some difference there. And there's a lot of arguments going on concerning that. But I'm just wanting to focus just on the Hebrew text itself, which I am partial to. And, you know, um, then, you know, you got basically the New Testament is made up of three families, the Alexandrian, the Westrian, and the Byzantine text types. It's not just one text, it's uh, the body of many texts. And so you have internal proof just in terms of, you know, looking at, you know, the transmission over time that God has preserved this. And then you've got different prophets, different servants of the Lord speaking at different periods of time throughout this history, primarily of, of biblical transmission, which, you know, um, we believe as the Bible records it is approximately 3,400 years um, it, to date. Of course, transmission would pretty much be locked down from the time of Moses, really until the last writings of John, uh, which we would put somewhere around but, you know, 90 AD, maybe 90 to 100 AD. And, and then the Bible is complete. And now what we've done is from that completion of the Bible, as God has spoken uh, by his servants, the prophets, these holy men of old, if faithfully deliver the word of God, then for the next approximately 2,000 years, it was transmitted a message directly to all humanity from God to us that we're responsible for. And so when we look in the, you know, without continuing on with, a, you know, talking about extant manuscripts or textual yeah. criticism or all the different things that people will bring to the table here, um, I wanted to simply say, I'll, I'll just start with my proofs and, and hopefully you'll appreciate from the word of God um, itself that the word of God is reliable and trustworthy. Now I know people say oh, you can't prove anything about the word of God from the word of God. Well, that's ludicrous. Okay. Because if I turn that argument on you, um, with the things that you believe, my goodness, um, you know, there's not going to be anything left standing here. Okay. And the, you know, once again, all your ancient history and all your historical references, please, uh, hold on. That's all through the perceptive lens, if you would, of the person who did the writing. I mean, talk about editing power. Um, and so, and when it comes to science, that's constantly evolving. That's constantly developing. Uh, what was said many years ago is not even valid today, by and large. And this is, you know, uh, not the case with the Word of God. It's provable. And not only is it provable within itself, it's provable in the sense that when we do what God says in his word, the way he says to do it, we get the results that he describes. And that takes it to another level. And I can hear some people gasping right now. And, and I, I tell you, you're gasping because you're overly educated from the perspective of having a bias so established in your life through people who believe something differently because no one has their own creative thoughts. It's transmission of thoughts, whether it's in academia, in philosophy, psychology, history, mathematics, maybe a little bit of an exception, but there's, it's not really because there's always this transmission going on and where every person's becoming a disciple of some school of thought. So I'm telling you 
we are those who belong to the school of thought that God spoke the word. He gave it to us through holy men that were faithful to deliver it just like he said it, not with some kind of um, unique um, uh, biased or, or expression that they added to it but faithfully delivered it and God then faithfully preserved it and kept it. So Proverbs chapter 30 verse 5 says to us, every word of God is pure. And, and you know, I can hear once again the arguments of coming, coming at us from wisdom literature and how we need to approach wisdom literature than we do historical uh, narrative. But that's just simply not the case. You know, we do once again are, are appreciate the need to understand figurative speech when we um, um, encounter it. There's not figurative speech. Every word of God is pure, it's just that simple. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. And in, and he's more than just, you know, a, a, a shield of a protection and a suzerain as a provider. Uh, and so we have to understand that, yeah, there are things and we'll talk about it more later, that we can appreciate from this verse of scripture as we look up what the word shield actually means, but it doesn't change the initial um, value of what God is saying to us right now. If his word is received by us and we recognize that it is pure, then his word is going to be to us exactly what his word describes. We're going to, as a result, he said something, we're going to respond and trust unto him. And as a result of trusting him, <laughs> we're going to be the benefactors of our beneficiary. We're going to we're going to reap the reward and the blessing of relying upon him. This place where, a, where Adam failed, where Abraham succeeded, and Jesus came and personified. And then the next verse of scripture, add not unto his word. That's just that simple. Now, where are we at? We're in the days of Solomon. Okay, so now we've gone from, you know, Moses and, and the period of time being validated again and again and again. This is what the Lord said to the days of Joshua, being validated again and again. This is what the Lord said. Now, here we are in, uh, jumping all the way past Samuel to the days of, um, of Solomon and hearing once again, the testimony. This is God's word. And someone could say, well, he's talking about what Moses wrote or what Samuel wrote. <laughs> Listen, actually, it's not him talking uh, out of his own creative thought and on the basis of his own experience. This is the Lord speaking. This is God talking through him. And, um, you know, it, that's you could say that that is, oh, well, our faith, um, but, and, and, and that's certainly appreciated, um, but from that perspective or that advantage point, it's God talking. So 2 Timothy 3.16 is, is the next place for us to go and look. Let's just jump right over uh, into um, what? A thousand years later, <laughs> all scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is the things that we certainly know about the scripture. And if you're and if you're going to argue from the perspective of oh, that's just your faith and that's your your belief, well, you know that's not even an argument here because we are all committed and consecrated to this is what God says. And what we want to do now is we want to understand how to approach what God said with the with the with the right kind of respect, with the right kind of reverence, with the right kind of commitment, and and do it in the way that the Lord said to do it so that we're not coming up with all these different ideas and all these many crazy ideas about God's word when he has delivered a message, one message to us. You know, there's not many truths. There's one truth. If I say my name is Sam, you, that's not a truth. My name is Mark. I was born with the name Mark. It's on my, you know, birth certificates and all my all my records. It, 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 that's so it is with every 
reality with everything that exists in the world. There is only one truth, not many truths. And so here we are in this situation where we're just talking about that truth that is presented in the scripture itself, not the many supposed truths that are being presented by all the various different religions, which are absolutely contradictory. There isn't even agreement there. There may be threads of agreement in different places, but they are by and, by and large on the very foundation and basis of what they represent contradictory they aren't included in many truths. There's one truth, not many truths. There, if you apply this idea of many truths, my goodness, <laughs> to all the things that you believe, you would be absolutely a nutcase. There would, there would be nothing normal about you. There would be no means by which you would be able to navigate through your everyday life. So this is not you know, in any way, a nihilistic world here. This isn't a world in which, you know, there's neither good or, 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 or bad or, or truth or lie or that's just as ridiculous, you know. It's not, uh, and so I'm not going to get off on that and all the philosophical things that are associated with that. Just staying here with the Word of God. Unfortunately, within the framework of the Word of God, many people have come up with all of these different truths, there's not a bunch of different truths. There's one truth. This is a story about redemption, God's redeeming work, the failure of men, their unwillingness to hear God, his continual mercy and love and humility and grace that can, reaches out to man once and uh, again and again and again to bring man unto himself, to get men to respond and say, you know, I'll agree with you, God. So, you know, our approach here is really about getting everybody on the same page to say, look, there's one truth here. Um, you know, quit it with all the many different truths. Jesus said to this to the to the Pharisees and to the people who studied the Bible at his day, he said, look, you th in, you think that you have salvation in the scriptures. You know, go back and, and study them, you know, <laughs> because they're testifying of me, testifying of, of redemption. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Okay, so it's God breathed, God spoke it, it's his word. Therefore, it's not going to have contradictions. It's not going to have all of these problems and all of these errors. We can safely trust in God and believe that the scripture is absolutely correct. And he is God, therefore he's absolutely in control. As a result, it has been carefully preserved by God. And so that is validated. And if all of a sudden we went and started looking at all these various different manuscripts that are out there and we found this huge variance, you know, in all these manuscripts, and of course the more manuscripts that you have, the more variance you would have. Okay, you take Homer's Iliad, for example. There's far less of them. I mean, I don't remember how many there are. There's not there's not a lot. But I mean there's like I think there's like you know and I may have said this before because it's an important point. You know, there's maybe 70, somewhere between 70 and, 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 and 80%. I think it's, I take it right at the middle, 75, 76% homology. And then there's the rest of that. And then you've got, you know, uh, greater than, um, you know, 25%, let's just say, uh, variance. Well, it, it's less likely that that variance is going to happen in a smaller family of of copies. The more you copy it, the more opportunity you're going to have for creating problems. Well, when you have just under 6,000, um, you know, extant manuscripts, then you're going to have lots and lots of problems. And I think you're not, and, and that's not the case with the scripture. That's not the case with extant manuscripts. And then when you take a family like the Byzantine family and the Western tradition and you put those uh, together, look at look at the homology there. You throw in the Alexandrian text type and suddenly all of we said we get a little bit more variance. But overall, you're looking at an amazing amount of agreement. And when it comes to those things, you know, points of importance to doctrine and understanding who God is and what he expects of us, I say that there is no variance. I mean, I would maybe back up a little bit on the Tishkendor text because it brings to us um, variants that I don't even believe should be 
accounted in the body of the uh, uh, you know of the extant manuscripts. You know that's my biased. Okay, fine. Um, but nonetheless, the overall agreement is absolutely a, in a clear proof that this has been divinely preserved. Hallelujah. So uh, once again, <laughs> that takes us beyond just this place of, oh, it's just your faith and you can't prove anything about the Bible from the Bible. <laughs> and whoever came up with that rule, give me a break. <laughs> okay, so moving right along, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished to all good works. Signed, sealed, and delivered here. This is not a book that is just something that is the, the, the opinion of men and a, an inspiration that some genius had because you'd have to be a genius to come up with these things. Um, and a genius beyond genius. And then, so let's go look quick, quickly again uh, at another verse of scripture. And first, uh, let's look at First Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 19. And, uh, you know, this is set in such a beautiful way. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's Second Peter. Um, this is set up in such a beautiful way because you talk about someone who could... Uh, bring their sense or their feel or their impressions or their interpretations or their experience uh, to bear and really have an impact on us, that would be Peter. And um, here Peter is saying, look, I'm in the, I was there in the uh, Mount, uh, uh, which we refer to as the Mount of Transfiguration, and I heard the audible voice of God uh, when the Lord spoke uh, to Christ Jesus. And he said, but you have a more sure word of prophecy. Wow, isn't that impressive? That should impact every one of us. It's, you know, so many people want to come with their ideas and their opinions and what they heard and what they drank. But looky here, listen to what Peter has to say. Peter says, I was there. I had. I heard the audible voice. Listen to all the witnesses he has alongside of him concerning the audible voice. But now he says, but we have a more cert, certain word. We have a more absolutely perfect description, a more certain word of prophecy, which is to say, this is what God has declared. This is what God has spoken. And you do well if you take heed as unto a, a light shining in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Is there figurative speech here? Yes. Is it integrated with a literal narrative? Yes, absolutely. This is where then it is very valuable for us to begin to do word studies and to understand how these words are used elsewhere in Scripture, not outside of Scripture. I don't want to prove anything about the Bible from outside of scripture. I want to prove the things about the Bible, what God is saying, not from what man has said, because everything outside of the scripture is absolutely clearly, plainly what man said. That should make sense to you. The only place of refuge that we have of what God said is within the framework of the scripture itself. So let us let words then be defined for us within the framework of scripture. And, and then he, let's go back to the very literal nature once again of this uh, narrative, knowing that first, knowing this above everything else, listen to our her hermeneutical rules, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Look, P Peter is saying in the context here, He's got some things he could say. He was there. He heard the voice. He had a special encounter. He had special experience. He had special perception that he could have brought to the table here. He's saying, no, we're going to speak directly from what has been delivered to us of what you have written out. And somebody may say at this point, oh, he's only referring to the Old Testament. No, he's not only referring to the Old Testament because we could show that there are already 
scriptures be, have, you know, having been in circulation by this time. So the arg and, and someone say, well, give me the proofs on that. And, and your point is well taken. Um, but the bottom line of it is, and we have a tradition then that is certainly outside of scripture that helps to validate that. And so, listen, we can say this about the Old Testament. And if that's where you want to end the argument that he's only referring to the Old Testament, fine, that's appreciated. Well, then you need to go ahead and then allow that same revelation and that same divine power that spoke in the Old Testament to apply, be applied to the New Testament. When my experience is when people make that argument, they then will back out and backpedal from that argument and then start telling us about how that the Old Testament has its problems too and, and then begin to uh, really um, effectively uh, reproach this verse of Scripture and in the end we find out that they don't even agree with this verse of Scripture concerning the Old Testament. I'm telling you, Peter is definitely speaking of the Gospels that are written and certainly he's also speaking of, of, of some, uh, if not all, um, of the epistles uh, of Paul, but at least some of them. And so back to what we were saying concerning our hermeneutical rules, that first and foremost, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. There's one truth there. It's not going, you're not going to be able to justify uh, distilling something out of the scripture that is not possible for us all to see, okay? So the for, for the prophecy, once again, let's hear it again. For the prophecy came not in old time, and, and certainly uh, those who want to argue he's referring only to the Old Testament has some support here, but um, we could also do a bit of a word study here and broaden the whole concept of what we're, what's being referred to as old time or former time. Yeah, you could go to ancient times and then basically categor categorically say he's only referring to the Old Testament, but nonetheless, prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, here it is, not by what men was thinking, not by their choices, not by their ideas, but by holy men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Over and again, that statement is given throughout Scripture that it was God the Holy Ghost that spoke, that spoke by uh, the servants, his uh, God's servants from the days of Moses all the way through and, uh, un until the very time when the canon of the, of the Scripture was completed. And as I said, by 90 to 100 AD. And God the Holy Ghost is still speaking. Praise God, he's still speaking and he's teaching and he's leading and he's guiding and he's still just as active. It's just that it's not a, a part of what we're going to write down as a contained canon because God has defined those boundaries, praise the Lord. Um, and, and we're not going to move beyond those boundaries. Okay, so let's look at uh, another verse of scripture, which you've heard me uh, refer to a couple of times now in Hebrews uh, one verses one through two. Um, once again, just simply establishing the validity of validity of this hermeneutical rule. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. How did God speak by the prophets? The prophets were literally taken over by the authority of the Holy Spirit. And their words were not that came out of their mouth were not their words. It was the voice of the Spirit of the Living God speaking exactly what God was saying in very simple language. Yes, there are parables. Yes, there are proverbs. Yes, there are symbols. But God has made every one of them understandable. And when we look at it from the perspective of the whole of the the scripture it isn't it is more of a a um a classification of the uh, minority of how he spoke when we talk about symbols and figurative speech okay he's had but here's what's once again very important to underline with respect you know to the new testament has in these last days spoken unto us by his son 
whom he's appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. And this brings to, once again, to the word of God, even that much more of a strong statement, or at least underscores in the strongest terms, the absolute accuracy of the word of God, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. Uh, when he had by his own, by himself purged our sins, set down the right hand of the majesty on high. So um, let, let me just, uh, I should throw in, you know, a few more verses of scripture here. Uh, let's just try to get, let's just try to get Matthew twenty four thirty five real quick, and I was hoping to get through this a little bit faster than I am, but it is what it is, and I may not go through the proofs on all of the hermeneutical rules. We'll just see, you know, how fast we go through the rest of this, and maybe you only use one more lecture just to prove these rules. Um, but one of the statements that is reoccurring. And I'm pretty sure you will find this statement in all four Gospels. It doesn't need to be in all four Gospels to be true. It just makes it that much stronger of a statement. If, if you could make God's word a stronger statement, um, obviously when you see it uh, at least two to three times, which is one of our rules, it's it just absolutely certainly established because you may misunderstand what somebody says one time or especially you're receiving it um, through another language and, and not receiving it through Greek or through Hebrew, there may be a number of different ways potentially to translate a single verse. Um, and so you may be able to misunderstand through that transmission, um, through the way that um, uh, the sentence was structured. Uh, you may be able to misunderstand or understand it in some unique way other than what it was absolutely intended to say. But when you have two to three witnesses saying the same thing, it, it's less likely that you're going to misunderstand the point. And if we follow carefully the rules, we're not going to misunderstand the point. We're going to get the point uh, as God has once again made it in very simple human terms and language for us to understand. So here it is. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. I mean, come on, how can how can we, you know, emphasize that Father is going to preserve his word? Um, and, and of course, this is Jesus saying, here, here's what he's saying. My words, what he said, okay? So he, the Lord Jesus also referred to the Old Testament when he said that not one jot or tittle, not one, you know, um, part or, or, or vowel or letter or consonant or, um, you know, mark, comma, uh, or any kind of punctuation, let's put it that way. Even the slightest little part of what was delivered, not one character, I mean, put it that way, probably better, is going to pass away until it is all fulfilled. I mean, you talk about divine preservation. So, you know, our rule is solid. We must recognize the scripture was spoken by God through holy men who faithfully delivered his word to us. And then we must go with the conclusions that we would derive from that and the, the correctness and the divine power and the certainty that what was said is absolutely what God said, okay? We may safely trust God and believe that the scripture is absolutely correct and has been carefully preserved by God. So, and there are more verses of scripture, but of course, if I continue to go through all the verses of scripture that are on this, um, I'm never going to be able <laughs> to finish this series. And I'm already 38 minutes <laughs> on one on one rule. Um, I, I love the word of God. I love talking about the word of God. I, I probably spend way too many t much time talking about our opponents out there and the people that want to run smoke screens against the word of God, try to make us believe that none of the Bible can be understood by a simple, ordinary, everyday person, and that there are many interpretations. So don't tell me I need to get saved and lived right because there's many interpretations. Don't tell me I can't uh, live in sin and, and be right with God because there's many interpretations. All that stuff is lies, just lies. Okay, number four, adding to the word and taking away from it cannot be allowed. And 
So I'm not going to really deal with all of the opponents um, and all the things that they would want to say about this. However, if I spent the time, I can absolutely certainly prove to you context. And because somebody, I can hear people say, oh, listen, he's talking about taking, you know, keeping things in context and he's taking Deuteronomy 4 2 out of context. No, I'm not. I'm just not going to spend the time to convince you uh, that it is context and hope if you're not going to be convinced after I'm finished with what I am going to say. Um, but if you needed more proofs, um, uh, you know, we could certainly give them to you. We'll just have to do it at some other time. Uh, once again, here in Deuteronomy, uh, the Lord is telling uh, us by his servant Moses, who has delivered to us all of these things that they that God has said, much of what they got to hear audibly is, is recorded um, in uh, Exodus, uh, beginning in chapter 19, um, but also then, of course, then written out by, uh, by Moses' hand. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish anything from it. <clears throat> Boy, let's grab a hold of that. This is our rule. Okay, do not add anything to it. Do not diminish anything from it. Um, you know, and I really love the statement of Paul here. If anybody says anything different than what I have said, he says, says, says to the church of Galatia in Galatians chapter one, he says, let them be cursed. Oh, if every one of us would stand in the light of that judgment, we would have more fear and awe and trembling about what we say concerning the word of God. We would definitely be more studious and more disciplined in terms of making sure that what we're getting ready to say is absolutely what God said. You know, I, I, I really enjoy uh, Polycarp's uh, epistle to the Philippians uh, as he was one of the last or the last survivor of, of, of at that time of um, or known survivor that time of uh, a person who had been around the apostles. He had been around uh, John the apostle and he was asked to, um, you know, give some kind of, uh, of address about his experience. Let's just put it that way. And what he did was he just basically, he writes it up a, an, an epistle that weaves together so much scripture, which helps us within the framework of extant manuscript studies, because we get to look at a very old document that is validating various different parts of the Bible as he thread together and spoke only the word of God. That carefulness, that all, that reverence, <clears throat> you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. And I'm, I, there's, there's no question about that that verse of scripture tells us why so many people aren't walking right with God because they changed the word of God. They've not valued it. God's word is powerful and will work with power and might within us, within, with divine power in us. But we're gonna have to understand as, one, as another verse of scripture that I'm getting ready to refer to here in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, <clears throat> Paul says, you received it not as the word of men, but it as it is indeed the word of God. Paul is saying, I'm coming at you with the absolutely, absolute written, uh, forgive me, absolute word of God. Write it down. It's written down for you. It's what God says. Don't add to it. Don't change it. If anybody says anything different, let them be cursed. I mean, that's karat in the Hebrew language cut off, okay, from the covenant, cut off uh, from the promises and from relationship and fellowship with God. So the highest of all warnings are put here, put forth in our hermeneutical, um, in our her hermeneutical rules. These aren't rules that are just subjective rules or rules that we can choose maybe to follow them and then, you know, maybe not just depending on how we feel that day. No, these are, these are rules that are absolutely established let's you know can, and we can go and uh, um in revelation 22 18 these are rules that you know they carry consequences with them if you violate them and so we want to teach you how to use them I want to just 
once again underscore them to you. We're taking this time to underscore them to you on this level so that they're just not something that you read over and say, oh, well, that's pretty cool, and then go on your merry way reading the Bible as you've always read the Bible, listening to what everybody's got to say and just taking them for granted. But rather, let's be Berean about it. Let's be diligent about it. Let's search the scripture and prove whether or not these things are true. And let's search the scripture, not trying to prove our bias, not trying to prove our own doctrinal opinions or what we've been taught because that's what we've heard since we were children. And, and some of that is good, but some of it is also not so good because people have come in and they've imposed their own perception and their own ideas on the word of God and demand then that you read every scripture in view of that bias. And we've got to, we've got to shun, we've got to shun that. We've got to get rid of it. We've got to divest ourselves of those things. Follow these rules and you will, okay? So Revelation 22, um, 18, he says, for I testify unto every man that hears the words of this prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the word of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. <clears throat> And from the things which are written, okay, and, and um, in this book. And, you know, once again, here's a place where we could say or make an argument that from, from a simple, uh, simplified reading, we're only speaking of the book of Revelation, and that is fine. But once, once again, let's understand, this is the signed, sealed, and delivered final wor um, work and, and book in the Bible. We've got the final uh, finality of the uh, Torah uh, in Deuteronomy, making the statement. And, of course, that does, does indeed um, encompass everything that Moses said. And now we have a finality uh, of the New Testament, um, uh, state, making this statement. And this is in connection, oh, let's look a little bit broader, this is in connection with to the revelation of Jesus Christ that he gave to his servant, John. This isn't just a singular revelation of a prophecy concerning those things that would come to pass during the tribulation. This then by uh, argument of who is giving this revelation and what this is about encompasses all the words of Jesus. And in reality, no matter who spoke in the New Testament, they were speaking by the Spirit of Christ Jesus. He is the head over the church. It is his word. It is his living word. So if Paul is speaking, he is speaking on behalf of Christ Jesus. It's the words of Christ Jesus being spoken by Paul. These are the words of Christ Jesus being spoken by John. The last book of the Bible uh, to be brought in uh, to the embodiment of what we call the canon or those books that the Lord would hold us responsible for in terms of the framework of what, of how we're supposed to live and interact with him, what we're supposed to be responsible for and what we will be responsible for um, on the day of judgment. Uh, as Jesus said in John chapter 12, um, these words which I've spoken unto you, they will judge you in the last day, okay? This is how, once again, emphasizing the importance that we hear it as God has said it and, 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 and uh, obey God um, in, in what he said. Well, Proverbs 36, once again, I could emphasize the same thing there in Isaiah 820, which is which also referred to previously, uh, don't add to the word and, and don't take away from it. And uh, it's God's word, it's pure, and, and he's upholding it. And um, not one jot, not one tittle is going to pass away. None of the words that Jesus said uh, is going to pass away. They will endure forever. If time goes on for another 100,000 years, his word, and we, even with all of the arguments, and we even with all of the people who are now uh, writing for the United Bible Society, <laughs> uh, or whoever else, and I'm not picking on anyone, or, or all these various different groups, and they come up with all these new translations, uh, and, um, you know, which have been, you know, for the past 100 years, primarily from the USB, or from, in many respects, the Tishkendorf text. Uh, Nestle Allen's uh, collection. 
uh, Westcott and Hort. Uh, still, the reality of it is, 100,000 years from now, we'll be reading the same Bible because it is divine. It's been divinely governed. It's divinely watched over. It's been divinely kept. You can be safe and believe in that. Let me see if I can hit another one real quickly here. We must let scripture interpret scripture. Okay, this is number five, rule number five. This very, very important rule. I need to spend a lot of time with it, just emphasizing it. Once again, I believe I can get through these rules with one more lecture. If you can just stay with me, I pray that you'll ultimately have such a, uh, a respect as well as such a care and, and value for these rules not to violate them in your Bible study. Um, we must let Scripture interpret Scripture. Um, we do not need other books or experts to understand what God has said. Once again, as I said in the introductory part of this lecture series, that we are going to refer to many commentaries, and we're going to refer to those that uh, we feel embrace God's Word the way that we've described, and we're also going to refer to uh, uh, commentaries uh, that don't have that kind of commitment and it comes out in what they say because they very clearly uh, reveal that they don't have that kind of commitment. But still, we're going to re we're going to look to what they say. We're going to consider what they say. Um, but once again, it is an essential. It is not needed. The Bible itself will tell us what the Bible has to say. We can only truly... Now, let me say one more thing with that. It's going to take us a whole lot more time studying. <laughs> it's great to be able to build upon um, the insights and the maturation of men who faithfully handled the Word of God and faithfully taught the Word of God. And there are many uh, uh, that we could we, that we could list. I'm not going to list them right now. Um, that after, let's just say, they spent 60, 70 years studying the Bible, it's great to hear what they got to say as they matured over 60, 70 years. So we don't just start from year one, and then, you know, 60, 70 years from now, we can ultimately say, wow, we're there where we can understand what was going on in, in this, you know, other commentator's life that we could have read and then built on that. And, um, and of course, that's not underplaying or undervaluing the Holy Ghost. That's why we have relying upon the Holy Spirit as our teacher as the first hermeneutical rule. Um, we can only truly understand the meaning of any passage of Scripture in light of all other Scripture on the same topic. And that is such an, you cannot breach these rules. Because if you do, you're going to make yourself a disciple of men. You're going to bring in all these other bias. And now you're going to be reading the Word of God through the bias or through the perception of somebody else. And we want to make sure that we're not doing that. If somebody's going to bring to us insight from the scripture that they derived only from the scripture by following this type of hermeneutical rule, then praise God, we're all in. We want to listen to what they say. It's going to help us in our growth and maturation, the understanding of the whole of the Bible. This may be understood even with parables by carefully regarding the response of Jesus to his disciples. Because Jesus said, you know, you don't understand this parable, then how should you understand all parables? So he's laying out for us there the rules of, if you would, interpreting um, parables. He's given to us what these various different symbols mean, and then we don't violate the nature of the, the symbol. Once the symbol is interpreted in Scripture, we don't need to interpret it again. We carry that same symbolic nature all the way through the entirety of the Bible. And hopefully, I'm going to be able to show you some applications of this so that you may more perfectly understand what I'm saying. And I'll try to do it um, on the next lecture series uh, that uh, lecture, I guess it'll be lecture four, yeah, because I'm not going to have time to do it now and, and do any justification to validating uh, this rule. So let's look real quickly at, um, uh, well, I don't want to go right to Mark chapter four, verse 13, because that would just simply be um, referring to the, um, referring to the verse of scripture that, uh, uh, that I just uh, mentioned. Let's look at, uh, let's just start at Psalm 73, 24 real quick. I, I know I'm out of time. 
Let's just look at this real quickly. Uh, Matthew, uh, forgive me, Psalm 73, 24. Okay. I've got to punch the thing in too, so. So here is the psalmist saying, speaking to the Lord, Lord, you shall guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me into glory. Uh, this really comes back to uh, the statement that we made earlier of the Holy Spirit being here to lead us and to guide us, but it also refers to the counsel that has already been laid down in the word of God, where the psalmist is saying, Lord, open up my eyes that I may behold wondrous uh, things from your law or from your word. Isaiah chapter 30, verse one. Let's look at that quickly. And as I said, I will spend more time in the next lecture, just really emphasizing uh, the proofs um, concerning uh, letting the word of God speak for itself. Uh, Woe unto the rebellious children, says the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. And, and then it goes on to say, and that cover with the covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin unto sin. And boy, is this a powerful verse of scripture for us to really dig into and understand. Where are we going to find the counsel of God? Are we going to find the counsel of God, you know, in, in, the, in the framework of what men uh, are declaring and, and speaking? Well, we certainly hope so. But where we know that we're going to find the counsel of God is within the framework of his word. What he's already said in his word by his prophets whom he anointed, signed, sealed, and delivered with his authority as divine authority, provable today because, for example, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, that book is still with us today. Everything he said is still with us today. There are many other people who came and presented themselves as prophets along Isaiah, alongside of Isaiah. None of what they said is here today. Many came along uh, side of in the day of Jeremiah saying that they were the prophets of the Lord and uh, only, you know, very few things that they said and prophesied falsely are recorded. There are no books in the Bible given to them. There is no divine signature. There is no valid proof that they said anything that God had purpose to be revealed to men because it was not preserved by him. So if we want to understand scripture, then we're going to have to let scripture interpret scripture. We're going to find that counsel in scripture. We're going to find the counsel of God, the understanding of what he intends to reveal to us through what he's already said, because every scripture is built on scripture. How can we emphasize this more? Uh, simply by saying this, when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights being tempted, what did he do? He quoted Deuteronomy. He quoted the scripture. And I'll talk more about that next lecture. Lord bless you. <laughs> so happy that you're participating with us. Our goal is for you to just be able to study the word of God and get the richness of all that Father has said so that you can profit from it and you can have the reward and the blessing of what uh, of and fruit of what only the word of God can bring and what only the word of God can produce because God will work a miracle on the inside of you by the seed of his word that there will grow and uninhibited will bring forth fruit. Amen. Love you.